This video will give you a complete roadmap on how you can master databases. It's going to cover topics which are beginner level, intermediate level, and advanced, and go over everything that you need to learn in what order if you want to be comfortable working with databases. Now quickly, I want to clear up a misconception. Databases are not just important to understand if you're a backend developer or a data scientist or you know a data engineer. They're also important for front end developers, full stack developers, really any type of developer to at least get a solid grasp of because you're going to use them in every single type of application that you write. And after all, if you think of what an application is, it's really just a flow of data. Saving data, updating data, deleting data, presenting data, that is really what software does. So you really need to dive into the core here and understand what I would say is the most important part of any application, which is the data. So with that said, let's get into it. Again, I've broken this video into three sets of skills, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. And if you want a list of all of these skills in a written format, simply click the link in the description. You can sign up for my newsletter and I'll give it to you for free. Okay, let's get into it with the beginner skills. So at the beginner level here, this is really all about understanding the foundations of databases. So that starts with what a database actually is. What is a structured data store or data storage? And why would you use this compared to something like a spreadsheet you know, or an Excel document, et cetera, right? Now, after that, you wanna look at the difference between relational and non-relational databases. So what is a relational database? What does that mean? And quickly have a look at SQL versus NoSQL. Now, you don't need to be an expert here, but you should understand what SQL stands for, so structured query language, and what a database that uses SQL can kind of do versus one that doesn't. For example, you have very popular databases like MySQL or PostgreSQL or, or SQLite, for example, and then you have ones like MongoDB or maybe Firebase, for example, right? So what is kind of the core differences between those? You should have a bit of an understanding before you dive too far into the syntax and get into the next section here, which is SQL fundamentals. Now, I always suggest that people start by mastering SQL databases. If you understand SQL databases, it's a lot easier to get into NoSQL and to see the differences and the advantages. So you want to start by understanding SQL, right? Structured query language and going over the common syntax there. So what is a select statement? What is an insert statement? What is an update statement? What is a delete statement? And I would highly recommend that while you're doing this, you use one of two databases, either a PostgreSQL database or a MySQL database. You can use SQLite as well, but these are the three most common databases. They're all very similar. So I would suggest just picking one. Most people go with Postgres SQL and do some experiments, write some data, update some data, data sorry, and understand the basic syntax. Now, once you have a little bit of understanding of what SQL is and some of the SQL syntax, you want to start looking at tables and schemas. Now, a table is really just a structured collection of data. You should understand what that is. And a schema is essentially a blueprint that defines the table structure. Now, this involves looking at things like data types, so like an integer versus a string versus text versus a date versus a Boolean. You want to know what those different types of data are and how you can structure a schema for a table. Now, after that, you want to start looking at constraints. Now, this involves primary keys, foreign keys, the unique constraint, things like not having a nullable value inside of the database. This is where you'll start to understand how to make your schemas a little bit more strict. And you get into, again, the basics of SQL, where you're creating a schema, setting up some tables. And then we move into the next step, which is the CRUD operations. CRUD stands for create, read, update, and delete. You need to know how to do that in SQL syntax. So for example, using the insert into syntax. If you're reading something, using the select syntax. If you're updating something, using you know update set, for example. If you're deleting something, using delete from, okay? Now, once you look at those CRUD operations, you wanna start getting into some filtering. So using things like the where clause or the order by clause to limit the number of results and look at, again, a little bit more advanced SQL syntax. At this point, you should understand what a SQL database is, how to create tables and schemas, how to insert data, read data, and update data at a basic level. Now, after that, you want to start looking at relationships and keys. So SQL is really useful because you can have a lot of related data that's kind of connected to one another. You can have, for example, one to one relationships, one to many relationships, many to many relationships. You need to understand what those are and how you can relate data together and start to do a little bit of database design. Now, this is going to involve using primary keys, foreign keys, and again, understanding when to use these different types of relationships in terms of how you kind of group data together. 
Now along those same lines, you're gonna wanna look at cascading and things like updates and deletes with that related data. Now I know that sounds like a lot, but that's really the bare minimum at the beginner level that everyone should understand. And that is the SQL fundamentals understanding relational databases, and again, really understanding relationships, which are very, very important. Now, I suggest to close this section out that you work on some sample projects where you just work with a good amount of data in a SQL database, and you do an exercise of, for example, designing your own database where you have maybe some users organized or connected with some orders, maybe you have some transactions or some payments. You can go to something like ChatGPT, ask it, you know, what's a simple SQL project I could practice with, but you need to do a little bit of hands-on learning here and try to design something on your own. So you can make all of those important decisions on, you know, what data type should I use? What relationship should I have? Where should the foreign key live? Etc. Now let's keep going here into the intermediate level, but you're gonna realize that as you start working with databases, it becomes important to use some tools to manage the databases, right? To visualize them, work with them, etc. Now that's exactly where today's sponsor, DataGrip from JetBrains comes in. DataGrip is an IDE built specifically for working with multiple databases all in one place. You can connect to almost anything like MySQL, PostgreSQL, SQLite, MongoDB, and dozens more, and get an editor that's actually smart about your schemas and queries. It gives you schema-aware autocomplete, instant error detection, a powerful data editor, and schema-aware AI that lets you turn natural language into SQL. It can also suggest fixes for your queries and do much more, all while understanding your actual database structure. You can browse data, edit rows directly, refactor SQL, and switch between different database engines without ever leaving the same window. Now, if you're learning databases or building apps that rely on more than one backend, mastering a tool like this can massively boost your productivity because it visualizes relationships, integrates with tools like Git, and brings all of the productivity features you'd expect from a modern JetBrain IDE. And the best part is that it's now free for non-commercial use, which means it's perfect for students, hobby projects, or anyone who wants to get better at working with databases. JetBrains just announced this, and it's awesome that you can use such a powerful tool completely for free. Try it out today by downloading DataGrip for free from the link in the description and see how much faster you can work across all of your databases. Thanks to JetBrains, now let's get back into it. So let's continue here with the intermediate level, which is really about designing databases for performance and reliability. This is where we get out of the absolute basics and we move into some more advanced topics. Now, the first thing that you're gonna wanna look at here is something called database joins and subqueries. Now, some might argue this is in the beginner level, but I think it can be a little bit more complex, which is why I put it here. Now, this allows you to essentially connect multiple tables together and to query information all at once and aggregate data in the same response. So you can use things like the inner syntax, left join, right join, full joins, and you need to understand what those are, how they work, and how you can make them the most efficient. Now, you also want to start looking into subqueries, for example, using nested select statements and getting into using aliases for readability of the database. Now, after that, you want to start looking at indexes and query optimization. It's one thing to query the database. It's another to do this in an efficient manner. And that's really where indexes come in, in terms of how quickly you can look information up in the database. You want to also start looking at trade-offs like write speed versus read performance and the way in which you design your database so that you know, am I going to do a lot of writes? Am I going to do a lot of reads? And what kind of operation am I optimizing for? Now, you also want to understand things like the explain query and how you can analyze queries for performance. Next, you want to start looking at transactions. Now, this involves using things like the commit and rollback syntax and having different isolation levels and concurrency controls based on how you're setting up your database. Now, you should understand common transaction use cases, things like bank transfers, inventory updates, etc. Next, we move to data normalization. Now, normalization helps prevent redundancy in the database, and you have different normal forms in your database. So you have 1NF, 3NF, and you need to understand what those are. Now, you also need to know when to denormalize for performance in your database. And I know a lot of this sounds vague. I'm not trying to teach you these concepts. I'm just giving you a list of things you can essentially look up to figure out what I'm talking about, right? Next on my list, we have referential integrity and constraints. 
So essentially enforcing different relationships through various foreign keys, things like cascading updates and deletes, but looking at it on a deeper level than we did before and handling constraint violations. Nearing the end of this intermediate section, I have things like query optimization techniques. So how to use indexes and multiple indexes effectively, avoiding you know selecting asterisks from the database, like why is that a bad thing to do? Limiting the results sets, using proper where clauses, caching and pagination considerations, and how you can make your queries as optimal and as fast as possible. In the beginner level, you're just trying to get the data that you need. In the intermediate level, you really need to think about how can I make sure this is as optimal as possible and I'm not wasting resources or doing something that you know, takes an unnecessarily long amount of time. Now, lastly, we get into a kind of a real world example here. So I always suggest, again, building something, working on a project to learn these types of topics. So if you could design, for example, a small e-commerce schema where you have like products, orders, users, reviews, maybe some kind of inventory, and then you write, you know, complex queries to join and aggregate all of this data together, you have the correct constraints, you add a bunch of data, you actually connect to it and maybe present it in a project. That's a great way to learn some of these more advanced topics. Anyways, that wraps up the intermediate section. Again, I know it's a lot of stuff, it might sound complicated, but now we're gonna move on to the advanced level. Now the advanced level is really about scaling and modern data architectures. So before we're talking more about kind of query optimizations and stuff on just the data level, now we're looking at really how do we scale the system, right? How do we scale databases? And this is more architectural where we get into more senior level skills. Full disclosure, I'm not a complete expert in this area, but I just am aware of a lot of these skills and I've seen them pop up with people that I work with or places that I worked at before. So that's why I'm mentioning them here. Okay, so first is scaling databases and vertical scaling versus horizontal scaling. So when do you add more compute versus when do you add more resources and start doing things like sharding, partitioning, and replicating your databases, right? This is things like read replicas versus write masters and getting into, again, more complex architecture where you have multiple machines in this distributed system. Next, we have replication and backups. So when do you back up the database? What data needs to be backed up? And how do you make sure that everything you have is always available and fault tolerant? Now, this also leads into various backup strategies. So like full backups, incremental backups, point in time recovery. You need to look at all of those strategies. You also need to look at failover and again, high availability patterns so that if one database goes down, your data is still accessible. Next, we look at transactions and scale. So essentially distributed transactions and two phase commits. This means eventual consistency versus strong consistency, looking at things like the CAP theorem. So consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Again, I'm not an expert in this field, but these are some things that you should have a look at. Next, we get into NoSQL concepts. So notice that almost everything I mentioned so far relates to SQL databases. That's intentional because that's really where you're gonna learn the most about databases and architecture. And then I suggest, again, once we've learned all of that, to start looking more into NoSQL databases. So to understand why NoSQL database exists, to understand the flexibility and the scaling uh, kind of problems or potentially advantages of using a NoSQL database, and then starting to look at things like key value stores. So things like a Redis database, right? Which maybe you would refer to as NoSQL, but really it's a key value database, and when that can kind of fill in or come into your system. Also looking at document databases, again, NoSQL databases like MongoDB, or things like Cassandra, where you have you know, column or stores, right? Even things like vector databases or graph databases. This is where you start to kind of spread out a little bit and look at all of the different offerings and particularly those strengths and weaknesses and being able to decide which one you actually want to use. Now that leads us into the next section here, which is hybrid data models. So understanding when you wanna mix multiple databases together and use a SQL database plus a NoSQL database, for example. When do we have readies for caching? When do we have a NoSQL database for you know, data that's constantly changing? When do we have strict relational databases? And what's the uses for those, right? Also, how do we log all of this information and what database is just the best for what purpose? So you need to understand the trade-offs between the consistency and the flexibility of these services and be able to argue why you should use one over the other. Next, we get into performance and observability, right? So things like query profiling, being able to view all of the logs. You have things like monitoring performance, so being able to look at the CPU, the input output, the various connections, the network uh, usage for your different machines and resources. This also leads into caching strategies. So having in-memory caches versus distributed caches, 
And then we look at things like schema migration management, especially in production environments. How do we make sure that if we adjust the database, we don't break everything? And how do we migrate large portions of data and set ourselves up for success when we want to do that in the future? Now, there is a lot of stuff here. And again, as we get further into this list, I become less and less of an expert. But these are things that you need to look at if you really want to get into more of a back end heavy role, a data engineering role. And a lot of what you're doing is working with databases. For most people, up until kind of the middle of that intermediate section is where I would suggest being. If you can learn more, obviously, that's fantastic. But the skills in this section are really if you want to go above and beyond. So with that said, that's going to wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next one.